Hello and welcome. Today, Peter and I are delighted to be joined by a long-standing client of ours, Juby Yao. Um, Juby is a former chief people officer of multiple tech scale-ups turned people advisor. And recently, we've been delighted to have the opportunity to sponsor and participate in the launch of Juby's new uh, fantastic newsletter, which, as I understand, has just passed the 1,000 subscriber marks inside just six weeks of launching. So firstly, big congratulations to you on that, GB. Thank you, Christian. So naturally, uh, as expected, there's been huge uptake for the content you're putting out and no great surprise there. Um, when setting about uh, writing your newsletter and, and launching it, how did you envisage people, professionals and business leaders benefiting from your content? So, in my day to day, I talk to a lot of founders, HR leaders, and leaders from different functions about the challenges in scaling startups in terms of organization, leadership, and people. I enjoy this conversation a lot, but sadly, there are only so many hours in the day. And I know I need to scale myself to, and to do this, I conducted some user research. And one of the key themes that keeps coming up is how much people I talk to, interact with, really appreciate either the feedback, the guidance, or the, pers uh, the perspective that I offer on topics related to the intricacies of scaling startup. And that's what they wanted to see more of. So I shaped the newsletter in a way to continue this conversation, but at scale. So in the newsletter, I will answer the questions that are most commonly asked by founders, HR leaders, or startup leaders as well as share my own learnings and mistakes along that journey. And I believe the more we share the understanding uh, and have the, the understanding of the common challenges faced in startups, the more we could effectively navigate the hurdles along the journey of growing our startups. And of course, to make this happen, Christian and, and Peter, I am so grateful that Hawkwood decided to support the launch of my newsletter. No problem. It's our absolute pleasure. Yeah. No, Jubes. You know, we've obviously been working together. With, well, we've been working together for many years uh, now. Um, yeah. I think uh, you know the the one thing that uh, you know people always ask me when they see you know lots of your content out there is, um, you know, what are the kind of like you know, how how would you describe um, your underlying philosophy um, that drives your content creation? I was, I was just counting how many years is almost a decade now. So when I was growing my career and trying to develop myself, I read a lot of articles by industry experts. And honestly, I remember I had to either reread the articles a few times because it was too technical. And sometimes I even lost interest halfway through. So I feel like the article's objective is more towards demonstrating the expertise of the writer, how much they know versus how much can they, as the writer, help the audience to take what they are sharing and either apply it or use it. Um, and I, I suspect it might not even be the intention of the writers to do it that way, but it's just the way we are trained on how articles are written so that it sounds credible. So the underlying philosophy when I write, whether it is a blog, newsletter, or social media post, I aim to tell a story to engage the re readers emotionally and mentally that includes actionable points that the readers can do something about and have fun in their learning experience. Yeah, because uh, you and I actually, um, we were fortunate enough to be at the Point Nine Talent Meetup earlier this week. And I, I mentioned to you that uh, from a personal perspective, I really appreciate how you take quite complex uh, topics and manage to articulate them in really easy to understand ways. And in particular, your approach to using stories. Um, you know, for someone like myself, who's not been professionally trained in a lot of these areas, I just find them far more memorable and therefore easy to apply. Yes. Um, so I'm curious to understand from you, your approach when you first determine a topic that you'd like to share, mm -hmm. how do you then go about um, basically communicating that in a way that for people like myself and others is, is so easy to understand? 
what I'm going to say, the concept is going to sound simple. The practice is the hard part. So first, start with understanding your audience, followed uh, by understanding yourself. And once you have written what you want to write, prune it ruthlessly. So when I write, um, I write for an audience of people who are in startups, who are experiencing the pain points of making the step change to the next phase of the startup's growth. And they would like simple, applicable solution to their problems. And to make this memorable, I need to cut through the noise of so much content today by understanding the psychology of the learner, retention of information in the brain, and so on. That's why I always focus on one or three points in each messages and the sentences are short or it is told in a storytelling format so that it's relatable. So very, very clear on the audience um, that I'm talking to. And I also mentioned that you need to understand yourself. And what I'm going to say is going to come as a surprise, but I hate writing. <laughs> um, however, I do love sharing knowledge. I am a learning and development person at heart. So instead of focusing on what I do not like, I focus on what I love, which is sharing knowledge, reducing the pain points felt by startup so that they can accelerate their growth. So in addition, I think I can communicate a message through drawings. Hence, you will see I use drawings, charts, diagrams, flowchart to illustrate the point of what I want to say. So one, understand your audience. Second, understand yourself, what you enjoy. Last but not least, once I've written what I wanted to write, I prune it ruthlessly. This is going to be the hard part, especially, you know, when I think that I had a moment of brilliance and wrote some beautiful sentences or shared a story that is close to my heart. But if it does not add to the point, it is nice to have. Just because I like it is not a good reason. So I get rid of it. And if I repeat myself, I get rid of it. I treat every word that I write as time taken from my audience. So I want every word to be valuable, hence more accessible to them. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, amazing. So I completely relate to that. You write something where you've used a nice metaphor or something and you're so proud of it, you're reluctant to cut it out. But it's, uh, it's yeah, you've got to think about your users really, haven't you? And whether they're actually getting benefit from it. So um, yeah, the pruning is, is the hard part. Uh, and I think that's why so many articles end up becoming so verbose. And um, yeah, ultimately, uh, I think uh, a lot of these kind of professional development books you read, you think they could be a quarter of the length and probably still made the, the point. Um, but yeah, your your articles clearly uh, embrace the philosophy of uh, putting the user first. So um, yeah, credit to you for that. I have to say, um, it didn't start and this is suddenly something I know uh, how to do. I have to shout out to a few you know, people, I had a writing coach, Jen, and she, she was brutal, my first draft, and she was going, this is repeating, what is this for? And I have friends who are in content and in marketing, and they will, and so that, that's the first step, right? I got professional people who know what they do. But then the next group of people that I also ask are my audience, I ask some people to pre read it, and they go, don't understand that. So when you do that many times, you start to build the skill to do that yourself. Yeah, amazing. Makes a lot of Brand, sense. Thank you no, for that. Well, it's clearly working. Um, but I think that's a really nice uh, discussion around the newsletter specifically. And I think um, what might be quite interesting from here on is to discuss in detail a little bit more around your own career and background uh, and some of the lessons you've learned along the way, which I think would be of equal interest to uh, many of the listeners and watchers, no doubt. So. Um, Peter, is there anything you'd like to kind of ask to kick us off? Well, no, I, I think just on that, yeah, it'd be great just to learn a little bit more about your journey and your transition into um, HR because, um, yeah, it probably wouldn't be the the typical journey that a lot of our, um, yeah, a lot of people, professionals will go to go through. Um, so, yeah, it'd be great just to learn a little bit more about um, the journey that you went on and that transition. To get to where I am, it is by accident. Um, I, I grew up with a strong, that's one thing that is constant. I grew up with a strong belief that as long as you learn and grow, you can achieve anything you want. 
but as you make the choice you know of of where you're heading towards your career very early on when you're a teenager in my culture parents steer your career into three choices doctor accountant engineer so i started my career as an engineer i think you forgot recruitment consultant <laughs> no <laughs> no i'm joking no, I understand. Be like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Not that well known in I think. Mm. So, and that's why I get really excited when I meet um people from Malaysia who are in HR. People like Sophie Thin. I was like, oh my god. Um, and and one thing. So when I was an engineer, one thing that I noticed um is how is how is it that great engineer when promoted into management, many times they become not so great a manager? And that has a huge impact on the team and the business. And I remember thinking, that's the problem I would love to solve. And that's why I rejected my PhD in AI and instead did a PhD in leadership development. And the squiggly career of my career started. And by the way, just a side note, when I was in organization, I talk a lot about squiggly career. So if you have heard me talk about squiggly career, I, this is the story. Um, I went into consulting um, after I did my PhD. I worked for a company called Duke Corporate Education. It's a consulting arm of Duke University and a top leadership development firm in the world. And I get to work with FTSE 200 clients. And for me, it was a dream come true at that point. But then the next problem pop out. I notice that the system, which is the organization itself, is not conducive to support leaders to embed what they have learned, even though these new learnings and behaviors are absolutely crucial to drive business growth, transformation or innovation. So I joined the system. So I went into a ship state who's one of my clients. It's the third biggest classified company in the world. I work across many different HR roles, trying to enable the organization to embed learning and change so that the business can achieve its goal. But a big system, as we know it, takes longer to change. And when the opportunity came when Shipstate, a 200 years old company decided to spin off a part of their business to be more agile, behave like startup, with a mandate to build the system from scratch, I jump at it. And that's the beginning of my startup journey. And of course, new problem comes with startup, particularly one that is scaling fast. The challenge then is how to enable startups to learn, unlearn, and relearn faster as they move through different stages of growth and the need to adapt to the new business and people challenges. So a career in HR in startup is a result of me chasing after a problem that I'm passionate in which is how to help others learn and grow so that they can achieve their goals and where possible their dreams that's amazing and um i mean one thing that's come through quite strongly there is that um you know in addition to wanting to solve a very uh, important problem um you've also by the sounds of it been quite strategic in terms of the types of organizations you've worked for you've um joined i think you mentioned the top uh, leadership uh, organization, um, Shipstead, going through a, a, a particular moment in time um, where they're basically, by the sounds of it, spinning off or, or reinventing a, a division. So how do you personally go about deciding which organizations to work for? So I'll answer this question in two parts. When, when you mentioned it was very strategic, to be honest, at that point, if I look back, I was not very clear but the important part is when the opportunity presents itself in front of you is that that is the moment to leap on it and go for it so if i were to look back uh, across uh, my whole career and uh, let's have a look to your question how do i um how do i navigate it so early in my career journey, when I was establishing myself and building my experience, I wanted a company and that pays well because I was moving to London as well. Um, and the re really random thing that I really wanted, I get to travel around the world for my job. Um, and a fancy job title, 
opportunity for promotion and a big name company. That is the early part of my career, around the middle of my career journey, when what I've just listed, all of those I would consider hygiene, when my hygiene needs were met, such as fair pay, several promotion, brand name in the CV, gain the fundamental experience and skill, what becomes important next is I want to solve interesting problem, one that I can stretch myself. So at that stage of my career, the decision to, to join a company or take a role is one that I would, that one that allow me to experiment, deepen my expertise and broaden my perspective and working with people whom I can learn even more from. And the example, <laughs> Peter, one of the examples I remember talking to Peter, I had an offer from Monzo and Culture Trip, and I chose Culture Trip. At that time, Monzo was the place everyone wants to work at. And Peter was surprised, why did I choose Culture Trip? And I was surprised too. <laughs> because going through the process, I know if I got an offer from Monzo, I would have gone for Monzo, hands down, no question. But what I realized during the process and getting to know the role expectation, I realized I already know how to do the job in Monzo. I've done it before. Culture Trip offered the stretch that I wanted. As I mentioned as well, early in my career, I was chasing promotion. But at this stage of my career, I actually took step down, so salary and title step down, um, twice, <laughs> just one twice, and it was painful, but I wanted to gain experience in two new specialist area of HR. The payoff is not immediate, but it was massive later on and it accelerated my experience and skill. And then on the later stage of my career, nearer to now, when I felt like I have more experience and skills to offer, then I am more selective of the people I want to deliver the impact with. And without a question, I will always, of course, want to work with kind, compassionate people. But now I am motivated to work with business who shares my vision and belief in HR, particularly the founder. Any problems is possible to be resolved. But if the founder do not believe that HR can enable the organization through its people to achieve the business goal, then it is a hard no for me because... All I will be doing is putting uh, out fires resulting from that belief. Mm -hmm. So I would say that what I look for in the company that I joined, the career decision evolved depending on the stage of my career and what I'm looking for. So if you decide, if you can't decide what you want, which many times I don't, start with what you don't want. That's very good advice. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. One thing I'd say, Juice, is we see a lot of people looking to make that transition into a people role from other fu job functions within a business. Um, and quite often when then looking for a new role, it can be quite challenging for them because they may perhaps not have that, you know, conventional HR background that a lot of leaders will be looking for. Have you come up against any challenges or hurdles when seeking your next career move? Uh, the honest answer is yes, it was difficult. And it's not even just from another function into HR, but as I mentioned, I was I started from L&D and I wanted to move into people analytics. Even that is hard. Um, mm. So most hiring managers want to hire someone who has done it before. And being a I can see both of you are nodding. Yeah, don't we know it? <laughs> Being a psychologist, I know this is safety bias and it is natural that we avoid taking risk. And in the past, so I've approached this in two ways. First, if I really, really want the job, it is on me to influence and help minimize the perception of risk for the hiring manager. So I would say, imagine you're buying a house and you go to view an empty house with no furniture. It might, you know, you might struggle to visualize how you will decorate it or how you might enjoy living in it. But if the house is staged and decorated with furnishings, it's easier to visualize how you would live in it. So in the case of hiring manager, I will work on painting the picture for the hiring manager. 
asking them, for example, of the problems they expect the role to tackle, help them visualize how I would tackle it. And if there's a gap in my knowledge and skills, again, I will paint the picture of the steps I would take to close that gap. The second approach is choosing who you will work with. And this is really important as well. So for example, if a hiring manager is not willing to take the risk, chances are they and I will have some big hurdles or values misfit that, where, when we work together. So I choose to apply for roles where the manager actually specifies or is actively looking for people that do not fit the mold. And I remember this is the case for Moo. Alan Keynes, the CPO then, was very open with me that I was a curveball candidate. Um, besides the hiring manager, I will also choose the recruiters who represent me as a candidate. Recruiters who find joy looking for the gems. And that is how Peter and I met when I was a candidate. <laughs> When I was hiring for my own team, of course, naturally, he's the one I choose to help me find the gem when I created a role that didn't exist in HR. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, but I think it's really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that piece on that. Um, definitely. Sorry, Christian, we're going to say something. Yeah, I, remember, <laughs> I remember when I was saying, I want to hire people mm. product, you know, uh, people product developer you were like what <laughs> he, he came back to me said juby's gone mad <laughs> but i have to admit yeah we at the time were like what the hell is this but actually um yeah it makes a lot of sense now that approach especially having seen jess's presentation on wednesday um uh, really made me want to read her book actually i said to the team on thursday morning because um yeah it's a completely different approach uh, from what we'd seen at that point in time, but makes a huge amount of sense. Absolutely. Yeah, and a lot more. Go on. Sorry, Juby, go on. I remember, I remember the time you tried really hard, and then that's when we found Lauren's profile. Yeah. And she was the first person that led the people product development team. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, amazing. Bro. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is that um, one thing I think we can all agree is that over the last few years, we've seen the kind of IC profile, individual contributor profile, kind of really like, um, I guess, basically, traditionally, I think people saw the, the management path, career path as like the kind of career path that you would go down if you want to get paid more money and have more seniority, etc. More recently, we have seen, you know, ICs have actually as much opportunity within an organization as a manager um you know we've obviously worked together for a while um, and i know that from um, having conversations with you over the years you know you always saw yourself as an ic you know you didn't necessarily want to be in a manager role um why was that and has anything changed well it's not that uh, i didn't want to i was adamant that i didn't want to <laughs> early on in my career uh, for a long, long time. And I remember one of my managers tried to get me to lead a team and I was not having it. And he couldn't understand why. Um, I grew my career to a director level without managing people. And I find so much joy in that. At heart, I am a builder who enjoys hands-on involvement, implementing and embedding initiative. And at a director level, I get to work a across the company to strategically roll out an initiative that has long-term impact. And I'm responsible for influencing SLTs, managers, employees, all without the formal managerial authority, if you like. Um, but yes, it has changed um, quite a few years ago when my frustration with the general direction of HR motivated me. I wanted to change the way HR as a function work and experiment with fresh approaches. And I know to achieve this, I had to own and lead the strategy of the HR function, which inevitably comes with people management responsibilities. And I am very aware that the manager's role is hard and that's why I didn't want to do it for a long time. It requires emotional re re resilience if I don't do my job well, I am directly impacting my team's career or I may have to make tough decisions that can significantly impact P 
people's life. But however, at that point, what hit the decision over is my motivation to change how HR works, outweigh that fear. So I have plucked up the courage to embrace that management responsibilities. That's amazing. And um, I have to admit, uh, as someone who obviously spends all day, every day recruiting people, professionals, mm -hmm. naturally, I know that a big part of that role is coaching other people in the business to be successful, to fulfill their potential, to be considering how they can build leadership qualities within their own teams, drive high performance, etc. I had assumed that would naturally make a people professional, a great people manager. Um, but I'm wondering if it's a, a classic case of doctors smoking and overeating on takeaways and everything like that, just based on what you, you've said, or is it actually the case that, that you feel that people professionals have a natural advantage when it comes to transitioning into people leadership roles? Yes and no. Yes, you definitely have the advantage because you're familiar with the challenges and you know the you know best practice tactics you know to to tackle that or what you need to do the difference is when you're doing it um so when when you're supporting when i'm supporting manager and no matter how much i understand what good looks like true secondhand experience it is not the same when you are the one who is making the people decision such as who to hire who to promote uh, who is not meeting expectation and also making business decisions such as, you know, initiative to drop or deprioritize, setting standards for the quality of work, giving input that impacts the future or even the continuity of the business. Um, the most challenging aspect um, is when you find yourself making decisions like ones that I mentioned earlier, such as having to inform your team that they aren't meeting expectation or even worse, that their job may be at risk or deciding not to hire somebody recommended by your founder's best friend and having to explain to your founder that they don't fit in the role in your team or explaining to your team why the project that they care about isn't top priority. However, with this first-hand experience as a manager, I've gained more empathy for the obstacles and the fears that often prevent managers from fulfilling their duty as they should. And hopefully with that insights, I can better, I can be a better advisor to the leaders that I support. Yeah, makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you, we obviously work with lots of people professionals uh, moving into their first people leadership role. Um, and I think one of the things that they are often asked by the um, you know leadership team is to be more strategic. Um, you know, what would your advice be to them? You know, someone moving into that first people leadership role for the first time, being exposed to the leadership team. Um, you know, what, what advice would you give them basically to you know enhance their strategic thinking? So I will quote Dave Ulrich to answer this question. Uh, Ulrich, as we know, is the father of strategic HR. By the way, I remember, I'm going to segue a little bit. Um, we were at a P9 conference, was talking to Jess one about, and he said, she said, you know, uh, Ulrich is a little bit dated. I was like, yeah. And because nowadays there's more children and grandchildren that has evolved from his ideas. But this is the one thing that I do uh, really appreciate, you know, his, his thinking about. So he says he would ask HR leaders what business issues concern you the most. And the answer to the question tells him how we think about our job. If the answer to the question is, you know, building a scalable HR model, setting hiring processes, managing diversity and inclusion, succession planning, and creating employee experience, so on. These answers tells him that the mental model of business issues is centered around HR. And he said HR is not about HR, 
but about helping the business win in the marketplace as a collective group of people. Therefore, the business issue of most concern should be defining where and how to compete through growing revenue profitably, serving customers to increase market share and MPS, increasing investors' confidence as evidence in the market value, or this is also one of my favorite, being a contributing member of the society that we are in. So to be strategic, our mental model needs to shift from centering around HR to centering around business issues. And he did share a very simple tip, put a so that behind our well-intended initial answers to pivot from a focus on HR to the business. For example, um, we need to automate onboarding so that we can accelerate our expansion into three markets in the next 12 months. Or we need to harmonize our benefits across five of our location so that we can attract similar quality of talent to serve our customers consistently and increase NPS in all of our markets. Just by connecting what we do to the needs of the business, we start to train our thinking to be more strategic. I love that. I'm actually going to steal that because I'm just thinking now about situations where uh, candidates ask us for feedback on their CVs. Yep. Um, and the CV is a list of uh, things that they've done. Yep. But I'm going to start putting so what on the end of it. Um, yeah. Because that's kind of the conversation I have with them sometimes. You know, um, we, we launched our first ever employee engagement survey. And I'm like, so what? Um, like, as in, that's great, but we need to link that to business outcomes and show what the ROI was on that. Um, and I think that's something people often have a tendency to leave off of their CV. And actually, when the CV is being, being viewed by a commercial, non-people person in particular, um, you know, they often don't know what a lot of these things are, but they know the outcome that they hope that, that the outcomes that they're looking for, the business outcomes they're looking for. So I think that's really, really interesting. Related point then, um, we quite frequently have people leaders come to us who say, look, my CEO just doesn't listen to me. Uh, this business doesn't value HR. Every time I come up with a recommendation of something we need to do, there's resistance. I'm not given the budget. When I joined, I was told we were hoping to do X, Y, and Z. They're not following through on it. And I find myself thinking that that's the very unfortunate situation. Um, but I also find myself thinking, has the people leader done enough to convince leadership of the merits of what they're looking to do? Because ultimately, if you are going in and making recommendations and proposals of how you want to change things, it is going to be difficult to get the requisite buy-in without sufficient supporting data. And again, this is a topic that came up in great detail on, on, on Wednesday, uh, due to be at the point nine meetup. Um, but from your perspective, um, I mean, clearly there are, you know, they're going to be, you better sympathize with both sides, perhaps, um, as would I, but what would be your view on how people leaders can go about getting that buy-in from the leadership team to make sure that their voice is heard and they're actually given the freedom and autonomy to experiment and implement new initiatives? So I really love listening to that question and I will dissect that part by part. We'll start with imagine a car salesperson trying to get you to buy a car. And now imagine us trying to convince our stakeholders to buy into our amazing people-focused ideas. So sometimes what we are doing could feel like a car salesperson. Let's face it, nobody liked to be sold to. And that's the mistake that I made too. Uh, when I started working with execs and founders, my focus was all about presenting solutions to them. But it was an uphill battle trying to convince them of the solutions. So there I was thinking, I've got the answers to your problem. So why are you saying no? And what I realized is as experts in our field, we can easily jump into solution or think that we have the answer, which leads us to then use the traditional sales model to convince others of our solution. When we sell our solution, we are putting our needs in front of others, to put it bluntly. 
Um, instead, the mindset shift for me is as experts in our field, we should think about how can we serve our users or stakeholders better? How can we understand or even help them understand their challenges and needs? So to do this, I actually wrote about this in my recent newsletter. Chris Doe, the founder of The Future, he reframed the traditional sales mindset and redefined the acronym of sales, which I find very helpful for us to apply. First is S stands for serving others. A, asking insightful question. L, learning to listen without biases. That's a hard one. E, empathizing with others or walking in their shoes. And S, summarizing what you heard. And when I do this, what I do is I create alignment of the problem we want to solve. And guess what, funnily, when we have that alignment, most of the time SLT just doesn't leave me to solve the problem because we have now established a shared understanding of the pain point. That's the first part. Then, as you mentioned, Christian, you know, then you bring in all the data, et cetera, et cetera, to, you know, frame, uh, to craft that solution and what's the best way to go forward. But the first part is you need to align that you want to solve the same problem and on the same page. Interesting. That's really powerful. Really. Sorry, Christian, we're going to say something. Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. I think one of the things, just to kind of add to that, one of the biggest reasons I would say that a lot of people will come to us because they'll be, and when they're looking for a new role, it's that they, uh, you know, feel as though they perhaps haven't got, um, you know, enough resources uh, within their people team. You know, they may have been promised something when they joined or given the kind of growth of the business or the growth plans of the business, they feel as though they need more resources within the people team, you know, what advice um, would you give to someone who, um, you know, I, I guess need, doesn't have the resources at their disposal, but they need to kind of, you know, um, kind of amplify their voice um, or perhaps they need to, um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, uh, uh, build. Achieve more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yes, it, it is the reality of startup. It's always growing most of the time, or at least it's the, always the intention. And what that means is our role will become bigger and bigger. Our organization become more and more complex, which means more and more responsibilities and more and more things to, to, to be done. And that is the absolute reality of startup. But if our capacity, if our capacity cannot be increased, and for example, no more hit count, or you were promised and, you know, there you go, we probably haven't achieved the growth we want, so we cannot have more hit count, but we have more things to do. We can't do it all because our capacity is finite. And if you try to do more and push beyond your own capacity, that's how burnout happens. So to achieve more with less, so if you find yourself in a situation where you need to achieve more with less, you need to always ask yourself two questions. One is, is this nice to have? And what is the only thing? This is the part I'm going to repeat and you can edit it off. <laughs> to achieve more with less, you need to ask yourself these two questions. Is this nice to have? And what is the thing that only you can do. So let's start with, is this nice to have? I remember I have a CTO who wanted to open a tech hub in Spain. Um, and we were growing, you know, fast as a business. We need more engineers. We need to hire faster. Sounds like a reasonable, solid reason, right? No, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. <laughs> we have, so we look at the data, we have a healthy pipeline of candidates. And we haven't even exhausted all our hiring strategy in the UK yet. For example, we were still signing up to new job board. We were tapping into different channel. And not to mention the tech team has been slow in setting up interviews. Mm -hmm. A hub in Spain is nice to have, but there are other minimal solutions with maximum impact that we could do right now, which is to solve the interview backlog. So some things are nice to have, but are not priority. So be rigorous in questioning 
anything is nice to have or need to have. And the second question that you should always ask yourself is, what is the thing that only you can do? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. And I will say this again, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. So to achieve more with less uh, of your finite capacity, you need to think leverage. So for example, a team member of mine um, can design a killer workshop. And some of you listening to this might know her, Lauren Gomez. And I remember in our planning meeting, I strongly suggested to her that we will outsource our leadership workshop. And you might be thinking, she can do it. She can do a good job at that. Why don't you just let her do it? The key is that we have limited capacity during that quarter and also the quarter after. Her biggest impact is doing the things that others can't do and only she can do and that we shouldn't outsource. And that is to design the performance management strategy and delivery. There are many, many things we can do, but we should not. We need to think leverage. Can I restructure work to help us achieve more? Can I automate processes to help us achieve more? Can I redesign ways of working to help us achieve more? <clears throat> so always ask yourself, what is the thing that only you can do and what you can leverage to achieve more with less? And that does it. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there, isn't there? Ruthlessly prioritize, uh, focus on really high impact, high leverage activities. And um, yeah, it's easy to think that every option is a viable option that should be actively considered. But I think it seems as though successful people are, are able to ruthlessly focus and prioritize. And it's so much, it's so much about what you say no to as much as it's about what you say yes to. So like, yeah, I love that. Um, okay. Um, a question I'm eager to ask is, uh, earlier we spoke about uh, your approach to managing people as a people leader. Um, and I guess we find ourselves in situations now where a lot of seed stage um, and see, well, I mean, it's certainly series A, but in particular uh, seed stage more and more are hiring the first people professional. And at that stage in their life cycle, they're probably not hiring an accomplished chief people officer. It's probably an emerging head of people or someone on that trajectory who would feel as though they still have a lot to learn themselves um, and actually really like the idea of working under a, an accomplished chief people officer so they can get that mentorship. That being said, some of these job opportunities are really good opportunities and naturally they hold a lot of appeal. Mm -hmm. So for someone going into their first people leadership role, probably in a smaller organization, how would they or how did you go about getting access to more and more sophisticated uh, people knowledge uh, and experience to help continue to advance uh, your professional development and how could they advance theirs? Yeah. So I was thinking about this when you asked the question. I was thinking I had a manager when I was in that trajectory, but I also remember going through four line managers in just six months, which means you also don't get the coaching guidance that you need. So in my case, I've always sought out mentors, uh, finding different mentors at various different stages of my career, because you might need different mentors at different stages and also in the areas of development that I want to improve. So I, for example, I really wanted to grow systematic thinking in people's space. I want to uh, think beyond what systems could do. So for example, in that scenario, I looked out for Steve Bianchi, who's my mentor in that area. Um, also, you'd be surprised where learnings can come from. So even though, you know, if you are the only people leader in your organization, we talk about, you know, you can find external mentor, but here's a little example. I actually gained my steepest learning in HR from two CTOs, Rian Liebenberg and Mary Williams. Tech function faces really um, you know, very real challenges such as intense competition for talent, diversity issue, and retention difficulties. 
and exceptional tech leaders excel in addressing these you know, tangible people challenges very effectively. And my understanding of HR truly significantly deepened through my interaction with both of the CTOs. And when I sought to, because we talk about, you know, strategic HR, and when I sought to grow my business knowledge, for example, I, in finance, I turned to my CFO uh, for insights into business operating model. I sought guidance from my head of delivery and to grasp the intricacies of product management, I engage with my product leaders. Also, it is important to recognize that mentors doesn't solely come from senior colleagues. And uh, when I aim to grow my industry uh, knowledge, I engage in a reverse mentoring with James, our business analyst, every Friday. I was in an I was new to iGaming world. It was com it was totally a whole new kettle of fish, which I've never been in. So I was like, I need to understand not just our business, but also the industry that we are in. So to evolve into a strategic HR leader, it is crucial to nurture our own development, not only within our functional area, but also across all aspects of the business. Yeah, wow. Well, James, the other thing I wanted to pick up with you on, you briefly mentioned it earlier, was around burnout. Um, you know, we've been, we've witnessed, you know, an increasing number of uh, people leaders uh, facing uh, burnout. Um, and actually, in some cases, more recently deciding to you know, part ways with um, the profession. Um, you know, as someone who's kind of consistently um, jumping into, um, you know, the kind of exciting world of uh, startups um, during their hyper growth phase, um, I'm curious to know, like, you know, how do you like personally, uh, you know, nurture your resilience um, and find the kind of well needed recharge to keep your career thriving? I know obviously your trips to Malaysia probably help for Know, several months at a time but yeah aside from that <laughs> that's how to learn how to do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does break my heart particularly since covid where i have career conversation with some really amazing leaders some which i wanted to hire who says i'm i fell out of love with hr i'm quitting the profession and you know the of course the environment factor plays a huge factor for the need of our support. So I have to also admit that the biggest learning for me came from personal experience. I used to think uh, people get burnout in roles that they do not enjoy uh, or love or environment that is negative, unsupportive and generally unpleasant. I could not be more wrong. Um, I was in a role, I was burned out in a role that I absolutely love and in an environment that's positive. And because I love what I do so much, I do more and more and more. And even with fairly large team, still feel like, you know, there's not enough hours in a day. And then I started to lose sleep. And when I'm sleeping, I'm dreaming about work, solving work problem in my dream. Um, and I was not present in my personal relationship. I didn't spend time with loved ones, families. I didn't see my family in Malaysia. Um, and when I fell ill, I went to see the doctor. And I remember just sitting there crying and crying because I was exhausted. The doctor signed me off work. And guess what I did the next day? I went back to work. Looking back, I am not proud of, not proud of it at all. I was not thinking clear. And most of all, what message was I sending my team working that way? And I love my team. They pack a care package for me, including coloring book, a bag of oranges, teas and snack, and sent me home. Um, after sleeping for what feels like days when my mind was clearer and my body was rested and talking to friends and mentors, the biggest learning was the lack of boundaries. I could have said, you know, I can sleep more, exercise more, meditate more, spend more time with loved ones. But without boundaries to create the space, I, without boundaries, I couldn't create the space to build healthy habits. It was too easy to slip into the risk of burnout. Um, you ask, how do I do, you know, what do... 
what is it now that I practice to make sure that I'm always performing at my best without risking my well-being is setting boundaries. Setting boundaries for work, things that my team and I need to deliver, and setting boundaries for ways of working. So if we look at setting boundaries for work, you talk, you touch upon that as well. Priority is the key. Be very, very clear on what is the most important problem that you need to solve because it is too easy to slip into solving everything and achieving nothing. Then focus on what is needed right now versus what is needed but not right now versus what is actually just nice to have. You don't even need it. So for example, if you're actively hiring a lot of people, onboarding is needed right now, maybe not career progression initiative. If you are you know, feeling the pain point of poor management, upskilling managers is priority right now versus salary benchmarking. Once you know the most important problem to solve, implement minimal, minimal solution with maximum impact. This is why we talk about MVP. Secondly, is setting boundaries for ways of working. This requires open communication and most of all, mutual understanding. For example, when I receive WhatsApp messages about work from my manager in the evening, it really stresses me out. I feel like, you know, okay, I was like, I'm not going to work. And while sitting there, you know, sticking to my gun, not going to work, I will feel bad and that creates more stress. Personally, I like to start early, finish early to wind down. However, my manager starts late and finishes late because he's, he has family commitments in the morning. I could easily say he shouldn't communicate with me in the evening, but as I mentioned, mutual understanding. So we talk about it and we agree that he can send me email any time in the day. He can send me middle of the night if he wants, because in our conversation, I realized I have very comfortable ignoring email, just not WhatsApp messages. It really triggers me. So it is a simple solution to something that causes me stress without compromising on what works best for him too. So when I set boundaries for the work that my team and I need to deliver and boundaries on how I work with people around me, I create the space for me to wind down, spend time with loved one. And as you mentioned, Peter, I have set the boundaries to finish work in November and then I'm going back to Malaysia before I come back to work again in January so mm -hmm. that I can continue to enjoy the work that I love. Yeah. The break is amazing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, I think I think that's amazing. I think uh, it's it, it requires careful planning and conscious decision making. I think because in isolation, some of these things can feel maybe a little bit incidental. So you get a WhatsApp message, okay. Um, but obviously, if that's going to be something that's happening every day. Uh, at least Monday to Friday, <laughs> then it goes from being a WhatsApp message to suddenly something that's really quite significant. Um, so I'd like to think, well, okay, but if I have to live every day like this, so yes, it's a WhatsApp message today, but actually if it's a WhatsApp message every day for the next two years, how do I feel about that? And if the answer isn't great, then I have to start making a decision over this today. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, I think it's probably worthwhile checking in with yourself a few times a year in terms of it. Is there any clutter or noise or any slight tweaks that I need to make that are going to just improve things immeasurably thereafter? It sounds like that's something you did really effectively. So um, yeah, huge credit to you for that. Um, you got to practice. And like you say, Christian, that's the key, right? Sometimes it's just a small tweak that you make and it's, you know, no big deal because for my manager, he was just thinking it's a message. For me, it is a trigger. So when you have the conversation, you realize. And like, so, so, so on point what you say, that small thing builds up. Mm, it does, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I actually ended up turning Outlook notifications off on my phone a few years ago as a result of a, a client who was sending me some quite vicious emails late one night. And I, I, I mean, I, to this day, I stand by my entire approach around it all and it I mean, I think facts would show that I was right in what I was saying in the end, but it um, it meant that I just couldn't sleep that night. And I just <laughs> thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, run this risk again because my whole next day was wasted over something that was so silly, really. Um, 
but yeah, GB, that's been amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, there's so much more you could you could tell us uh, and we could learn from you. But that's what the newsletter is for, um, not to mention your blog uh, and all other content and uh, but pretty much any people or talent event these days that wants to uh, have you there as a, as a speaker. So um, to that end, anyone who's interested in hearing more from you, reading more from you, um, where can they find you? The, the easiest is LinkedIn. And of course, I have my newsletter that you can sign up on my website, which is literally www.jubiyao.com. I, I was grinning away because I was having a conversation with my best friend recently. She's like, I can't find your website. I'm like, my name. <laughs> <laughs> and that I've heard for 20 years. Couldn't find me. <laughs> You've done very well to get that domain. Uh, yeah, it, does, it should, in theory, make things that very easily, albeit your best friends somehow struggled. So, um, yeah, we'll make sure we, we link to that everywhere, of course. Um, but, yeah, on behalf of Peter and I and the rest of the team here, we'd like to thank you very much um, for the last hour, um, not to mention everything else that you've shared with us in the past by way of uh, insights and tips that have been really useful for us and, of course, always successful uh, recruitment collaborations as well, which I know uh, I'm speaking on Peter's behalf, but I know it's always been an absolute joy working with you. It has been fun for me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jude. <Brilliant. laughs>